And welcome back to Punchline, proudly powered by Telcom Kipchumba Murkaman. Leader of the majority is in the ring with us tonight. Senator, let's talk about the Division of Revenue very briefly. Um, and, of course, just uh, days ago, Thursday, I think, was it, um, the Senate finally you threw in the towel in as far as that debate was concerned, although you did point out that you will continue to pursue the case on the appropriation act of 2019 and its legality and whereas you claim that this was sort of somehow chivalrous that the senate was not willing to drag the kenyan people through not having those uh, county finances any longer isn't the reality that you have arrived at the conclusion that as the president said there simply isn't enough money we can't say there's enough there isn't enough money um because if we were to do re rationalization of uh, national government budget on functions that are already devolved on areas like health, agriculture, water, uh, environment, we'll still find some resources to, to, to devolve to the counties. Unfortunately, we found ourselves in a very difficult situation. And the difficult situation is this. The Constitution never anticipated that you would have a situation where division of revenue would be ignored, but one level of government still appropriate for itself, which is the national government. Why the governors were in Supreme Court and we were in the High Court was to a quick, we wanted a quick decision from the Supreme Court that would give directions as to uh, whether appropriation bill by national government is legal. If the Supreme Court had done its job to stop the appropriation bill at national level, everybody would have come to the negotiating table mm. and an answer would be found. But for as long as the judiciary was getting its budget, the parliament was getting its budget, the executive at national level was getting budget and disturbed, and the county government was suffering, and yeah. the first quarter of the, of the new financial year is almost ending, it became politically and practically and economically impractical to continue holding on, uh, uh, fighting for the extra uh, almost 20 billion we were pushing for mm -hmm. at the expense of the suffering of the county. But the president said it uh, quite clearly in it July. It is not for the president. He, he, the, what do you mean it's not for the president? If anybody uh, yeah, just, knows just what's and, and in I'll the president's statement, he said this, that we have given them what we have and what we know we can find. From where he sits as the implementer in chief, if you like, uh, right? There simply isn't more money right now. That is not the constitutional job of the president. You're speaking out of turn. I am speaking as now you the senator. You think the president should be quiet on matters? Absolute division wow. of revenue. Wow. The, the president should not have. In fact, uh, by putting pressure on the institutions of government, by president pronouncing himself, it made it difficult for a negotiation to proceed because you can see governors could not even defend themselves. The judiciary could not make a decision. They felt they sufficiently intimidated to make a decision in good time. The president does not have money to allocate anybody. It is parliament that has the responsibility to allocate money to national government and county government. And the responsibility of government uh, of, of parliament to work through that negotiation once it's done allocates money to national government and county governments but because we come from a history a constitutional history that believes that there is a donation from national government to counties there are people who still believe that the way it works is that counties come with their baskets begging for money from national government and Anne, let me say this you think that's what the president thinks no let me just say this on the debate this time round on division of revenue, mm -hmm. the Council of Governors mm. was a total letdown. It has the weakest leadership I've ever and seen. And yet they were to benefit. They, from they it. Were, yeah, they were the benefit. The president speaks in a funeral that says that there is no money. They clap. They don't say anything. The president goes to a county assembly in Akuru, tells them, receive that money as it is. They stamp their feet and clap. As a Senate, we felt completely insulted that the people who are implementing, who should be implementing devolution, mm -hmm. and who should have stood by what devolution is all about. You know, you know, Anne, what President Uru Kenyatta uh, is at the moment, I'm not worried about but President Uru. No, let me just say this. I'm not worried about President Uru Kenyatta. But if we continue establishing a president mm -hmm. where one level of government will be telling off counties and tell them we can give you what we want to give you and a proposition bill of the national government will go on. Let me tell you the but truth. But that's not what that, that level of government you, no, said. I'm just that level you, of government let said let we tell can you, tell you let, we'll let, give you what we can find. And I, I ask, no, no, let me even conclude, though it is not, I conclude this even sentence, if it is not, it's even if it is not the, the onus of the president perhaps to directly make that statement, but surely as the president, he sits, he looks at the budget, he sees what KRA is bringing in, he's seeing what revenue collection is like, even for counties, if he says, 
from where I sit, this is not possible. It's not that we don't want to. It's not that we're doing your favor. Who is this it's we? That it's not that. Who is this we? We, we is on the, the parliament. Treasury. The executive are coming with their bowl to beg for the resources from parliament. The same as counties. It is not for the national government we are to not dictate. Broke. It's not for the national government mm. to dictate how much should go to the counties. And I must insist on this. Mm -hmm. It is the responsibility of parliament through division of revenue. Right. That is why the national government should not have appropriated what they don't have. They should have waited for division of revenue to be concluded. Okay. Then we can do appropriation bill. Fair enough. And and what we are what we if you had me say mm -hmm. that we lost the battle but not the war right but not the war the reason was we will pursue the constitutional position mm -hmm. of the the relationship of appropriation bill at both levels of government and division of revenue if the courts made the right decision which is the constitutional right position mm -hmm. that you cannot appropriate before division of revenue passed right. then proper negotiations will happen last year remember in 2013 and i want to just remind people mm -hmm. in 2013 the Senate did not pass division of revenue. Why? Because National Assembly and National Government colluded, passed division of revenue, and ignored Senate. We went to court. And although the courts delayed, it made it possible in 2014 up to now for the Senate to participate in division of revenue. So what we did as Senate was to do what was practically possible in the benefit of the nation, but ensure that we pursue the ultimate uh, 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 constitutional position that will be for the many years to come. Well, we'll and and, and, and you cut me short when I was happens. making the most important yeah. position. You, please make people that position must remember, People must remember that presidents come and go. Hmm. President Uzu Kenyatta may be benevolent. Hmm. He may be nice. He may be a honest man. But there will come another president who could be a dictator. And he could just wake up and say, Counties can get 200,000. They do what they want. We are working on national and government. Forget about it. For so to... it's important mm -hmm. for all of us to always appreciate that we must do things for posterity. Fair enough. We move on to the handshake quite uh, briefly and quickly. On March 9th, he said, quote, handshake is the worst political fraud ever. Why do you believe that this handshake is a fraud and uh, not a way to bring the country together the way in which the first handshake that you allude to between the president and the deputy president did? Because one side of the, of the, one side of the handshake which is the jubilee side led mm. by President Ruru Kenyatta believes that the handshake was to bring people together. It had nothing to do with uh, elections and it had nothing to do with, it has nothing to do with 2022 and it has nothing to do with changing the constitution. The president has, has insisted, he said in Moranga, he said it even this week, mm -hmm. that it has nothing to do with creating positions of power, it mm -hmm. has nothing to do with changing the constitution, it has nothing to do with 2022. Our friends on the other side, you know, are telling us that this handshake is about sweeping some people as a tsunami. It will take them to the sea. Do you know what tsunami is, Anne? You know what has happened in Bahamas? Yes. And uh, what tsunamis have done? The one that did great damage in India. Mm -hmm. Do you believe, honestly, that a person who came to a handshake to unite the country mm -hmm. would use even such a language that it was about us versus them. It's about uh, the handshake is coming to sweep uh, a, a group, a certain group of jubilee politicians and take them to the sea and destroy them. Fair that, enough. That let, me, let me ask you this then. The you have talked about I'm saying. the fact that on one side, yeah. the jubilee side was very honest in going to it. And it's been more than a year yeah. uh, since this handshake. Why do you think if that is, is in fact the position that the president who was the handshaker mm. for your team mm. would continue in something which would conspire against one side. Why does he not see it that way one year on? Because he continuously tells people, support the handshake, including today. Absolutely. But the handshake, the, the, the handshake of President Uru Kenyatta, as, as he understood and he told us, is not the handshake of Raila Odinga. Is he oblivious of the arguments of he his own see, deputy I, I side? Think, I think every time the president has always answered the former prime minister by telling him all the time it's not about 2022, it's not about elections, it's not about changing the constitution. But unfortunately, every time the president says that, the other one keeps saying it's about changing the constitution, it's about tsunami that is coming, it's about all this. It is this... Uh, it is this deceit that that has been imported by our friends who are not been working with us that made me believe that this is political conmanship do you is there a way to differentiate between the handshake and the bbi or is it one and the same for i you? thought it was the same thing it is the same yeah, yeah, I think it's the same if, if if that is the case and I, again i return to you that and, and the, you believe that the president is an honest broker then clearly there is something from your point of view that he is not seeing 
or that he does not necessarily agree with or otherwise why would he remain in an equation like that or is it due to the so-called uchawi of Raila's camp which you often uh, <laughs> allude to yes yeah. well I, I think I, I think the president is a practical politician uh, as a result of the handshake uh, there, is, there is calm, there is no opposition in the country, mm -hmm. there is no mandamano, there is quietness, mm -hmm. and there is this little uh, deceit in, at the corner there that somebody is preaching that it will be about 2022. Uh, for as long as that person is saying President Kenyatta will support him in 2022, mm -hmm. it's about President Kenyatta in his own heart knowing that he never promised anyone to support them. Number two, uh, I think he's making a practical decision that we have problems with this handshake in the way my, my partner has understood and he is preaching. But for as long as there's calm in the country and gives me room to do my things, mm -hmm. we can survive with it as the time being. Meanwhile, people like myself help out, help in calling out the deceit of the, of the other side so that, but you feel so betrayed. that in 2021 or 2022, they don't come back and say President Kenyatta betrayed us. It do you feel be betrayed clear. now? I don't feel betrayed myself. Why can't uh, the deputy president and Raila Odinga, um, the ODM uh, leader, bury the hatchet in the same way uh, the president and the deputy president did? Because surely their argument was much worse than this one right now. Do, do you think they have? Uh, do you think that Raila Odinga and the de and, and the president have buried and hatch any hatchet? I don't think so. You don't think they are. What Raila Odinga has just uh, established and learned is that you cannot longer fight with someone who, who, who has nothing to lose. President Kenyatta has nothing to lose. He's not a presidential candidate. He's uh, retiring and so forth. So the only thing so is done is, is, on his is, is well? just political expediency on his side to just buy time, pretend that he is helping President Kenyatta as he prepares himself to now later say he expects support from President Kenyatta. That is it. It is not for if President Kenyatta today was running for president in 2022, you would never there find would be no handshake. There, there would be no handshake. What do you think of the BBI? I know you've said uh, it's the same as Handshake, but I'll still ask as, as Senate Majority Leader, are you privy to any report, perhaps, and, and what is your position? Uh, I, I must say very clearly that my position is the position of President Uru Kenyatta, that the BBI was going to make recommendations that facilitate an environment that we work together as brothers and sisters, no fighting, no fault, and so forth, that it has nothing to do with the politics of 2022, and that it has nothing to do with changing the constitution. If they come with any of the two, then I will know that that is not a recommendation of the president because the president is an honest man. He could not possibly be lying to us. Uh, and number two is that I have not cared to go and find out. Even if the people of Kenya said this, they've been going around the country collecting views. I, I don't think BBI, said, you know very well that BPI has not been about the people of Kenya. I do not. Has, uh, has, why would you say I that? Say they've been so going around the country collecting views no, from Kenyans. You know, the BPI has been going to certain choreographed uh, uh, meetings that are in, uh, organized by county commissioners uh, with a few people in an office. I have never seen, I don't even know when they went to my county and I don't see any leader who was even uh, available. Many governors, you heard them saying that uh, they only hear that they were here or they were there. Mm -hmm. And the reason is obvious because it was not expected that they were not going to, were going to make recommendations that are going to make a big difference in the country. So the reality of what I know about BBI is that it is, I saw a civil society report led by Professor Yash Balgai and team who came up with a very serious indictment that it shouted, shouted in ministry, the it has no, nobody knows what they are doing, mm -hmm. no, nobody knows the report to who, and, mm -hmm. and so we... You would greet it with caution. Yeah, we, yeah absolutely. Fair enough. Uh, the, uh, quickly on the referendum, uh, you've talked about... Uh, Punguza Mizigo um, on 20th of July on your Twitter account. And uh, to paraphrase, you said MCs have a great opportunity to stamp the authority yeah. on this one and they should basically kick the, the baby down the road to yourselves. I mean, do you support? It was taken first to mean that you support the Punguza Mizigo initiative. Is that in fact the case and are you supporting it purely to prove a point? No, I haven't, uh, I haven't applied my mind on Punguza Mizigo because it will formally come to the Senate. So at that point in time, we will critique, we will read, we will do all that. So why should MCAs The, the point uh, I was making about MCAs is that I was just making a, a very important intervention for on behalf of MCAs. The document, the few pages I've read, are very supportive of what MCAs are doing and is very colorful insofar as counties is concerned mm -hmm. and resources of counties. Mm -hmm. And if I was a member of county assembly, this would be the document we would use to make a statement to the nation that we cannot be ignored. You know why I'm saying this. MCAs have always been the 
uh, a punching bag for everybody. If anything goes wrong in devolution, say MCS are traveling. Mm -hmm. Yet in parliament and executive and everybody travels, including Raila Odinga went to Indonesia with public money. With, uh, <laughs> and, you bring Raila and, and he's not working. Can we just focus I'm on, saying on that because he's been very vocal against the MCS. Um, uh, and so all this conversation about MCS this, MCS that. Uh -huh. If MCS are now going to allow themselves to be dictated by political forces like myself or any other person to tell them, don't pass this document. Mm. I, I think if they, will, if they need to stamp the authority and they believe in the, in the things that are in Punguza Mziko that relate to themselves, I would rather they even pass it and send it to us, even if it fails in the Senate of National Assembly, but for people But surely, to appreciate something as important as a possible referendum, do you think that MCS should only be seeking to prove a, a political point I, I, that I we think can do the this, political, or should actually I, I consider think, the think, merit of the I document the in front of them? And I think the important meritorious position they should consider is the question of money more going to the counties and money going to the ward level. And if that is not something that will attract MCS, then there's nothing else. If they fail to apply their minds independently and dictated by the rest of us, because most of us, including myself, have mm -hmm. doubts about this report from Pongo Zamziko. Okay. But if my county assembly was going to agree with me, mm. then they would never have another so, opportunity. So you were just to, being to, expedient to, to, on to, that. To, uh, to, last to, Thursday, to you... Um, uh, talked as the Senate uh, on that loss of division of revenue and you said, quote, there needs to be a redesign of the composition and roles of the National Assembly to ensure that the House at all times serves national interests. Very briefly, if you would, uh, because this appears to be a proposal mm. to change the Constitution, constitution. what do you mean by redesign and composition? We, I, I, I chaired the committee of the Senate in 2016 that came up with uh, constitutional amendments to make uh, bicameral legislature work better and for devolution. And I, we have a huge document. My vice chair was Mutula Kilonzo Jr. Kiraitu was in the team, among others. Uh, Orengo was also in our team. We have made a voluminous document that when the time comes for Briefly. us to dis di discuss about uh, amending the constitution, that is what we will present as Senate. But briefly, it's just to make sure that the Senate of Kenya operates like the Senate in the United States, where all laws that originate from the National Assembly come to as the Senate as an upper house for clearing. And approvals of, of importance of constitutional office holders mm -hmm. be moved to the Senate. And... Uh, and, and in my view, this is my personal views, mm -hmm. I think if we want to equalize this country, I am not very far from what uh, you've had as the majority leader National Assembly say. I would be personally, and this is not the view of President Uru Kenyatta or Jubilee, mm -hmm. my personal view is that if we want to make this country less politically volatile, mm -hmm. we should have a parliamentary system of government where the Prime Minister sits in the National Assembly and we should not have deputy prime ministers. Just have a prime minister sitting in the National Assembly, and uh, you have ministers coming from National Assembly. Mm -hmm. You have a Senate, which is an upper house, and uh, constitutional office holders approved from the Senate. And then, you know, you have uh, senators now performing the role of clearing house for all bills and checking the ministers who are sitting in the National Assembly. When is the proper time to bring that proposal forward? I think President Uru Kenyatta told us, uh, and he requested, that we should not engage in any politics, including referendum, mm. to give him room to do his, uh, his big four agenda. It might be very difficult to have a jubilee-supported referendum uh, in this term of President Uru Kenyatta. So but, you should, should happen after but the I election? But I wish, I wish, I wish. Because if you say after should the election... Should it happen after the election? If it happens after the election, we again postpone postpone this uh, system of government because it's, uh, it, will be it should be the one used by the, for the election. So that when we go to election 2022, we don't have an election of a president. Everybody goes to run in a certain constituency. We meet in parliament. The bigger party come with the prime minister and we will not have this. Should a referendum happen now? I think, I think not. that what, what's if, your if we were to agree on the issues and, you know, at the moment there is no national uh, process for amending the constitution. If the president was to really agree and sit with all of us and we can call a national leadership conference and agree and say we want to have a constitutional review okay. process, we should put a small team like the one for Yashpal guy yeah, to work on something. And okay. maybe somewhere in 2021, build consensus, uh, and, build consensus and have a document that we fairly agree somewhere in 2021 there, right. we pass it so that 2022, 
No. We should not have presidential elections, in my opinion. <laughs> okay, let's uh, talk about uh, the one corruption uh, very quickly. But I must Ma apologize March. because uh, uh, I, I know... Uh, what happens to your... Uh, yeah, many of your, my your friends... friends. Uh, many of my friends, your, your, including... Your key friends. Yeah, 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 <laughs> many of my friends, um, all of us who support Jubilee, and uh, maybe my friends who are close to the deputy president and so forth, who believe that he has right. already done or whatever, yeah. may not uh, may not be very happy with this. But you see, in politics, but those are your views. But yeah, it's my views, and it is for posterity. And let it us may happen on. now or may not happen. Uh, fair yeah. enough. Uh, yeah. Corruption. Back to the March 9th uh, tweet that uh, we alluded to earlier. Uh, you went on to say that the handshake is being used as a scheme to fight one individual, together with a charade called the fight against corruption. Do you truly believe that? The government of President Uhuru Kenyatta is perpetuating on the Kenyan people a charade, an absurd pretense. First of all, uh, it is a misnomer and uh, misunderstanding of the Constitution to say that uh, when DPP and DCI and all these independent institutions are criticized, we are criticizing President Uhuru Kenyatta. In fact, the DCI, theoretically, and the DPP, theoretically, and the judiciary, should be able to hold all of us accountable. And we should not give directions from any of us. So when I criticize that this is a charade being misused for purpose of fighting one individual, I know what I'm talking about. For example, I'll and give you the example of Kim... Uh, let me who's give you the, the leader? Who's the puppeteer in that uh, I am still... Uh, there are a few functionaries who are in government. I am yet to understand uh, where the operating center is. But for reality's sake... When the lifestyle audit was proposed by the president, mm -hmm. all of you, including the media, and I think it's a, you are part of the collaborators, you did some lifestyle audit on William Ruto. When William Ruto said, I'm ready for the world lifestyle audit, that lifestyle audit didn't die. I can say without shadow die. of doubt, punchline was not on the air. <laughs> so you must be talking about others. Other but people, go ahead. Yeah, but right. the point is this. Mm -hmm. You did, uh, uh, you did uh, uh, a lifestyle audit sort of on one individual. When William Ruto says, I'm ready, that thing died. Uh, if you look at Kim Warir, it started by a cabinet secretary purporting that, uh, you know, recording a statement and saying, oh, you know, uh, the, the, the deputy president called this, did that, and so forth. If you look at uh, most of the conversations about corruption in the country, including, again, uh, perpetuated by the media, and all these politicians, including people in office, every time someone is arrested, they say the deputy president's person, the deputy president person. But, Andy, something very curious about, about this fight against corruption. Mm. All the governors who have been charged in a court of law for corruption are people who were seen associating with the deputy president publicly. And let me repeat, there are governors whose reports are very damning in the Senate. But because they support the handshake. Such as? Uh, I don't know if I should... I should say their names at the moment, but as a matter of fact, you know that uh, the governor of CIA, for example, had been indicted publicly in mm -hmm. many of the reports that are related to corruption-related issues. Uh, you have an host of governors, and immediately a person is seen walking around with the deputy president. They become a target for... They become a target for, for arrests. It is something very curious to me. I might be wrong, but and, I hope... And, no, let me just say this. I hope I am wrong. But you know... You can hide. You can hide the truth. And yet, the president is you can't okay hide with this. He is not raising have, his voice have, on the matter. I have told you, Anne. Forget about the president when it comes to fight against corruption. The moment the president has a hand in it, it means it's not a fight but against corruption. But we're always corruption. talking about political will because being necessary for fight against will, corruption. Political will. So if he says do it, then the, it is perceived that the office holders who have the actual constitutional responsibility will go with it with zeal because they know that, you know, the, the, there the, is that will. The, no the one at the, the top the, is fighting the, them. The political will we are talking about is non-interference. It is financing. It's allowing those institutions to operate independently. Once the president has uh, provided that, then let the DPP and DCI work. Are lifestyle audits an important part of fighting corruption? Yes or no? No. Why not? We already know how much you earn. We have an, we know what you remit in taxes. We can observe your lifestyle. Well, may, uh, I, it is a maybe let me put it this way. Mm -hmm. The lifestyle audit we talk about, mm -hmm. you know, those things of saying, why do you have a car? Why do you have a house? Why are you doing this? All that kind of thing is not the right thing. But a properly 
a legally provided lifestyle audit where the, it is linked to your earnings and linked to your, how you make your money and how you transfer that money, they already there is a legal process for that. But if you are talking about this idea that uh, someone was telling me, is telling us the other day, oh, you know, you, you, you just wake up one day and tell someone, oh, why did But why would you imagine that's not what we're talking about? Why would you imagine that's not what the president was, was uh, talking about when I he ordered for when these I talked about, uh, when the lifestyle audits? When the president announced the lifestyle audit, mm -hmm. I said that there is no legal framework for it. But you just said that there's already a legal framework that provides for, for The legal framework is just about what is existing is about your declaration of taxes, mm -hmm. which is already provided for in law, mm -hmm. and also about money laundering. If you are found to be moving money in your account, that cannot be explained. That's so which, already which, what is but missing? That is, that is not lifestyle audit. What, 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 is, what kind of legal regime would it require for a proper lifestyle audit, one that could not be misconstrued? I, I think the first thing is mm -hmm. for people to explain what's a lifestyle audit. But the I one, asked you whether but, you but think a one, lifestyle audit but is the one which has What did you public, understand by that? Uh, I understood to mean mm -hmm. this argument that uh, we must know why somebody has a car, has a house, why is so-and-so giving money to Arambes. And all, that's not <laughs> lifestyle audit, in my understanding. That is? Uh, I, I think that's witch hunt. <laughs> Do you think uh, the fight against... <laughs> because and you know why I'm we can Richard. laugh on punchline. <laughs> you know Let me why? just say, for the, on the seventh show, we can laugh on punchline. Let, let's move on. We are yeah. running out of time. Yeah. Do you think the fight um, against corruption uh, is credible? For instance, if it does not, if it only focuses, for instance, on uh, Kenyatta era yeah. uh, corruption, current uh, Kenyatta era uh, corruption, and ignores the Kibaki, the Moi, the senior Kenyatta era corruption, it's not credible because. You know, corruption, crimes are, cannot rot, yeah? You know, even if it was committed in... You know why people are still being punished for the, uh, for the, for, for, for the crimes that were committed in it last time, yeah? Because crime cannot... There is no limitation of time when it comes to uh, crimes. So, if we are fighting corruption, let's just do it systematically and apply to everybody. Uh, mm -hmm. And for every corruption that ever happened in the so, so you would support the full implementation of the TJRC report? What about the 2004 uh, Kroll report? Uh, all the reports that are uh, useful in unearthing this cancer of corruption. And by the way, it mm -hmm. must not appear as though we are opposed to the fight against corruption. We are just opposed to the selective uh, a fight against corruption. But fight against corruption is very important for this country. Mm -hmm. And we must be able to do it so that we can save our nation. And, and let me say this. Of all the institutions, we must commend also the DPP for what it does. Um, he has done his best, but I think the DPP's office is overwhelmed in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, okay. reading through the voluminous purported evidence. And you've seen after some time, the DPP makes a decision based on further review of the document. So we must give them the benefit of doubt. What about the DCI? But people, the only thing... Are, I, I think the DCI uh, sometimes is uh, extremely jumpy, uh, uh, and particularly in areas that they may have little understanding about. And I don't want to give examples because those things, like are, and uh, the things are in court. It, 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 but, but, but the thing I want to, 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 to say here is that we must never put pressure on the courts to convict people at all costs. We must not put pressure on the magistrates. And I'm worried about magistrates because they don't have security of tenure that there, there could be a youth political interference by the executive and elements in the executive that want to use the fight against corruption to sort their competitors. And I suspect that is the situation in the, in, in the, in the, in the Kiambu issue. The Kiambu, the stopping of the governor of Kiambu from going back to office is one of the most suspicious uh, processes and the greatest abuse of the Constitution of the but, Republic of Kenya. But, uh, let me leave that there, but, but finally and briefly, if we could just talk about Aurora and Kim Um Did you or companies associated with you receive payment either directly or indirectly in the award of the standards? Let me, can I, can I put it this way first? Yeah? Why me? Why did you think about me? Because you have been perhaps the most outspoken legislator though there have been yeah, others yeah. the most outspoken legislator on this matter and you have also said on the record why, i have why, a personal interest in this in, this, in this is matter. taking place in my area so, etc so why why did you ask why did you put your question and okay. say why are you so interested with the Kimware and our own matter? Because that would give because, you a proper answer. Because that is not that, my that, question. That, my that, question <laughs> is about <laughs> my question no, is my question. And my question is about whether you, you stood to benefit 
financially? No, zero. Absolutely zero. Nothing. It has no, nothing to do with it you. It has nothing to do with me, but it has everything to do with my constituents. All right. What is, therefore, your punchline? Well, um, I like to say that uh, at such a time as this, as uh, Republic of Kenya, we are at a, a very, uh, uh, you know, at a position of um, what I can say a paradox. On one hand, we have political calm in the name of, uh, we have a handshake. But on the other, we are losing a lot democratic in, in terms of democracy. We have a country that has no opposition. We have institutions that are not being oversighted. We have intimidation of institutions of governance that are very important for uh, human rights protection like the judiciary. It's important for each one of us to have a honest conversation on how to move this country forward. And as Kipchumba Murkomen, I will continue being as candid as possible to make my little contribution mm -hmm. to taking our country forward. And that's our time tonight. Thank you very much, Senator Kipchumba Murkomen, leader of majority in the Senate, for joining us on Punchline, another episode next Sunday, proudly powered by Telcom. I'm Anne Kiguta. Good night. You can put them on now if you want. I can box. Not me. Not yeah. me. <laughs>